graphic adventure game that harkens back to the heyday of the genre. It introduces you to a wondrous town ready for you to explore, filled with quirky characters and an intriguing dark mystery. But as the story pulls you in, you start to ask yourself whether you are playing the game or it is playing you. May Borowski has dropped out of university and returns to her hometown of Possum Springs. It's a former mining community that could be mistaken for any other in small town America. She's looking for the familiarity of her old life, but her friends, her family and her town are not quite the same. The opening immediately sets the tone of the game. May returns at night, but her parents have forgotten to meet her at the bus station so she has to venture into the night to make her way home. First there is a simple fetch task and then some platforming with light problem solving. All well and good and it gives you a sense of expectation of what the game will be like to play. You walk back and forth, press X to jump, movement controls feel responsive as you would expect. You can later traverse the telephone lines and make May bounce on them. When you arrive into town you meet your parents meet your friends and for at least the first two to three hours spend your time walking up and down the main road initiating conversations that most commonly are limited to two possible choices with one line the first one virtually signposted as being the best one by offering to reveal more of the story or character history so unlike for example LucasArts games which can offer five or six answers this offers two and you feel like you are being steered to choose the best one so you spend your time toing and froing back and forth to initiate the single action, conversation or event to allow you to progress and this is the crux of the gameplay. However, the game is broken up into days separated by you going to sleep at night with you having to complete tasks before being able to progress onto the next day. In this way, the game keeps a firm control of the overarching narrative but the side effect is you never truly feel that you can go and do what you want because you are always aware of this invisible confinement. Before going to bed at night, May can chat to her dad who is sitting comfortably in front of the TV and when she comes down for breakfast, she can chat to her mom who is sitting at the kitchen table. On one hand, this routine does seem confining but on the other, it underlines the motif of family and it makes me feel nostalgic. Much of what the game is, is not just the gameplay, but witnessing the characters in their lives, how they interact and experiencing their story. May is wrapped in a cloud of mystery, as everyone asks her why she left uni, and she is never ready to disclose why. Her old school friend B had to grow up fast after losing her mum to cancer. There is a bitchy outer layer to their friendship, with gentle jibes. B is at first sardonic, but there is also a great kindness to her. Greg is May's best friend, easily excitable, who off screen has some down moments. It's nice when we learn more of his and May's shared history. He is in a relationship with his boyfriend Angus. There is no drama about this being a gay relationship, it just is. Greg and Angus interact naturally and it's a compliment to the subtlety of the storytelling. When May is talking about having a statue of herself made, she says, make it tall delightfully revealing her own physical insecurities, oozing with self-doubt and pre-adult angst. Her social anxieties add another layer. Her right ear twitches when feeling nervous. She wears a t-shirt with a no something sign. No what? It's never actually made clear, but she feels strongly about something or is looking for something to feel strongly about. Quite amusing. There is a part where two estranged friends are together and one is drunk, the other puts her to bed and calls her by her childhood nickname, it's a tender moment that you don't often find in games. Everyone is snarky and chats with a night all tone. May and Greg are old friends and they have the sort of banter you would imagine for millennial tweenies, but they are in their 20s. Seeing May chat to Greg behind the counter, it did seem reminiscent of Clerks by Kevin Smith. One big misstep is the developers have tried to take a leaf out of the Neil Druckmann playbook by copying one of his storytelling techniques. It's clear they wanted to add a little twist to the story, but if a detail comes up from out of nowhere to the player with no previous reference when there was an opportunity to reveal it, then the surprise feels contrived, forced and dishonest. 
If you listen hard enough, you can almost hear politicised gaming websites like Polygon and Kotaku clapping their hands like trained seals, lavishing it with praise and calling it progressive, virtue signalling so everyone knows how delighted they are. But it is cynical and it stands out as an example of poor storytelling setup. A big part of Night in the Woods is the mood. There are some delightful moments of whimsy, like when May and Greg are just chilling, having fun and smashing light bulbs, which could have controlled better, or sitting on a bridge to indulge in a quiet moment with nature. But this is strongly contrasted with a story grounded very much in the real world with all its associated problems. Set in a post-recession present day America, there are missing people, people who have lost their jobs, had to sell their homes, cancer, miscarriages. It's a bleak picture. Everywhere you turn, there is a sad story, so there is a sense of melancholy that permeates the whole game. It's like the developers want to make a profound social commentary, but they don't know quite what they want to say. A contrast is the much needed moments of humour. Some of the jokes seem quite laboured, but there are also some laugh out loud moments, although not too many. Of course humour is subjective, but for me, the game often raised a smile. And there are some beautiful moments of malaise and yearning for the adventure beyond the sunset. Personal relationships are at the emotional core. This isn't a story about an adventurer traveling alone into a new land. This is a story about a person returning home to familiar faces, friends, family, fellow students, mum and dad. The portraits at May's home decorate the house, but also imbue it with delightful character. At times, you are given a choice on which friend to spend an evening with. What I didn't realise is that unlike some adventure games, you do not get a second chance, so you cannot go back to spend the evening with a friend later. This artificially closes off certain sections, and the only way to experience them would be to play through the game again, many times. What's so mesmerising about Night in the Woods is the art style. Anthropomorphic characters that are so bedtime story cute in their design, they could be the stars of a children's book series. Besides being cute and attractive, the graphics serve another purpose. Regular art might put off gamers by making the game seem to be worthy or serious. The cute graphics here attract and draw you into a fun game by stealth, then slowly reveal the more serious themes. The contrast of cute with the serious makes some of the story beats all the more shocking and powerful. You see squirrels rushing about and pigeons, old people on mobile scooters, leaves move as you kick them. There are filmic special effects, transitions between scenes and areas. There are some modern touches as the camera zooms in and out for dramatic effect. There are also normal cats which made me wonder if May knows she is a cat or she is not and they are all humans but are just presented to us as cats. Maybe that's a question to ask the next time she meets her god. Headphones or good speakers allow you to appreciate the sound of the birds cheeping, squirrels scurrying, playing through the leaves, pigeons fly off as NPCs walk past. Little touches, when on the telegraph wire, the music gets quieter as if to reflect the distance from the ground. When characters speak, to know what they are saying you have to read the words. There isn't any voice acting. There is virtually no voice sound, just a half-hearted subdued beeping. Perhaps a lack of full voice acting was a creative decision but there is not even a Simlish or Banjo-Kazooie style nonsense voices. You might say this is for stylistic reasons, but there are two characters on TV who have voices, like Banjo and Kazooie. These voices are able to convey humour of the words being said. Without a doubt, the characters would have benefited if the full spectrum of their emotions was able to be conveyed orally. What deserves a special mention is the outstanding musical score by Canadian composer Alec Holoka. It is a gorgeous mix of soulful incidental music, indie, pop and synth, all infused with May's emotions of self-doubt, hope and excitement. Yes, it is upbeat, but at times there is darkness. There is also so much variation across the tunes, yet enough commonality that they all fit together. The video shot music could be an upbeat indie tune from the 90s. The enchanting music when rooftop stargazing. There is what sounds like the electro harpsichord from the menu. Some tunes are so lovely with their gentle upbeat warmth, they are like an oral blanket you just want to snuggle up with. 
And it's great hearing a reprise of a track you heard earlier in the game, but with a twist, like the main theme played on a piano in the historical society building. The soundtrack is so beautiful and so perfectly fits the characters in the game that it actually elevates Night in the Woods to a sum far greater than its parts. A real triumph. Whilst Night in the Woods is a graphic adventure come walking simulator, it is interspread with a series of mini-games. There is a more obvious game on May's computer, Demon Tower, a retro game, the sort of game you would expect to be given away free by Sony for PlayStation Plus. <gasps> the game has echoes of the main theme music. More interesting than that are the actual mini-games that are intended to complement the story but vary in their difficulty, such as stealing, which I found too hard, to building a robot, which was way too easy. There are also a series of twisted dreams you have, which involve rudimentary platforming, Whilst there are some elements you can climb up and jump across from, it would be deceitful to call this game a platformer. Also there are some rhythm games where you have to play bass in a band. Unlike Guitar Hero, you won't get kicked off for hitting the wrong notes. The standout tune is Die Anywhere Else, which I later found myself humming the tune to and singing the words. Mini games give variety and break up the monotony, but they seem to be an acknowledgement that really there should have been more interaction in the main game. At one point, you arrive outside the historical society. There's an abundance of text, but you are not given a chance to even move your character. Just select text, then the next location. This leaves you feeling disengaged and a passenger on a story unfolding before you. There are too many periods of just pressing a button to read the next line of text. It's not that it isn't a good story, it's just that it mostly feels like an interactive novel. Press X to progress. Press X to turn the page. The mini-games cannot disguise this. This lack of interactivity feels too much like the turn the page walking simulator. When there is an actual meaty puzzle, the characters self-referentially refer to adventure games. He says, this is like work, as an in-joke for the audience, but one that feels sniffy, like it's turning its nose up to grandfather adventure games from LucasArts. Near the end of the game, it's almost exclusively pressing X for an hour. I call Night in the Woods an interactive narrative adventure, where the majority of the game is interacting by pressing the same button to make the story progress. The developers, instead of dreaming up a story and letting players walk around it, they should have taken more time to integrate environments and puzzles so the players could become a part of it. This would engender a sense of personal involvement and pride when solving a puzzle. Full interaction would have elevated Night in the Woods into the sphere of all-time mega classic. Night in the Woods is a charming adventure game bursting with hip characters in a contemporary setting. The endearing art design really brings Possum Springs to life and the musical score is perfect. At its best, it feels like a great coming of age indie movie blended with a summer blockbuster. Ultimately, it doesn't live up to its original promise. Its failing is that the developers prioritise telling a clever story over gameplay, which has resulted in a game that too often leaves the player feeling like a passenger on a delightful ride. Despite this, if you are happy for a more passive, interactive experience, there is much to love in Night in the Woods. <laughs>